Welcome back to our video module on dynamics. Today, I'd like to revisit our previous pendulum problem. I've redrawn it over on the right hand side of the screen and I've substituted rectangular coordinates for our polar coordinates, which is how we did it last time. I can also imagine a similar pendulum problem. We'll say it's hanging down, gravity is acting, and it has the exact same center of mass as before. However, in this case, we're going to make it a rod with some sort of polar moment of inertia. How is this new problem different than our previous one, if at all? Today, we're going to use our new understanding of angular and linear momentum. We'll take a look at our original pendulum problem and follow a fairly similar evaluation strategy with our new one. So let's start off on the right hand side with our equations of motion. Today we'll use angular momentum balance to uh, attack both of these scenarios. So let's redraw our free body diagram to help us out with that. So for this we'll include basically the pendulum, the entire string. We're looking at point O or the origin here with some sort of reaction force X and Y and we'll sum the moments about point O. Go ahead and put the video on pause and see how far you can get on setting up these equations. So hopefully you were able to look at the sum of the moments being equal to the change in angular momentum, set up your differential equation, come up with something that looks like this, and with a small angle approximation find out that theta basically follows an a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t solution with the interesting fact that omega equals the square root of g over r. This should be nothing new as we've done this before. I'm sorry, I seem to have left the tension force as if we had cut it, but in fact we won't cut it because we're looking at the overall system, and the tension force would be better written as a sum of the force of the x direction plus the force of the y direction, which are shown in the diagram at the base. Now, let's take on the rigid body pendulum. Let's start by drawing a free body diagram. Go ahead and put the video on pause, see how far you can get. So hopefully you ended up with something like this, with some unknown forces, force X and force Y, reaction forces at the base, and the force of gravity. You'll notice that the free body diagram looks pretty much exactly like our original free body diagram. Let's write our equations of motions and see how things change. We'll start off with the sum of the moments about point O is going to equal the change in angular momentum, no changes here. The sum of the moments are going to be R cross FG, but where we see a difference now is the change in angular momentum will have one change due to the motion of the center of mass, which is simply going to be M R squared alpha times whatever acceleration or theta double dot, whichever way you want to put it. But we'll also have a change in angular momentum due to the polar moment of inertia, which is I combined with the change in the angular velocity or I alpha. We get the radius times negative sine theta times mass times gravity. And on the right hand side, we'll have theta double dot times the quantity I of the center of mass plus m r squared. We isolate theta double dot and we get theta double dot equals negative m g r over I plus m r squared, the quantity times sine theta. Now we have our differential equation reduced to quadrature. If we wanted to make the small angle approximation, which we still can do, we end up with minus mg over i plus m r squared theta equals theta double dot. Let's move this over, which means our omega on this is going to be the square root of mg over i plus m r squared. So we've been able to solve this, but let's try and understand what's really happening here. 
The first thing is we notice our free body diagrams are the same. The forces acting are exactly the same. The system's response to those forces is going to be different. Mainly, right here, we have an additional I alpha term when we're trying to see the change in the angular momentum. This additional term means that our solution doesn't quite simplify as much as, much as it did earlier. However, more importantly, what we see is that in the denominator, we have an I. Instead of just an MR squared, we have an I, which means there's an additional term that is, decrease, that is increasing the denominator or decreasing the angular acceleration. So the angular acceleration now is not as big in quantity because we have some polar moment of inertia influence. What does that mean? Well, that means that it doesn't, the system doesn't want to move as quickly. Where would we see that come out? We'd see that reflected in the omega of the system. In the original omega of the system, it was just simply the square root of g over r. Now, however, on the right, let's pretend that we have a zero for our polar moment of inertia. We still have our square root of g over r. Oh, no, we don't. Uh, my apologies on this. We should have, I dropped an r here, and we need that. Okay, now it's technically correct. So we have a square root of uh, g over r, but the reality is we do have an i. Well, what does that do? That additional term increases the denominator, which means that the overall frequency of oscillation is going to be lower. So what do we see happening? We see that a more realistic pendulum, one that involves some sort of rotating rigid body, rotates a little bit more slowly than our idealized point mass. Hopefully this side-by-side -side comparison of a point mass pendulum with a rigid body pendulum gives you a better intuitive understanding of the influences of a rigid body compared to a point mass. What does this look like in terms of energy? Well, let's imagine that we have uh, some sort of potential energy. We have both the rigid body pendulum right here and the point mass pendulum right here and they both have some sort of potential energy. So we see that um, some sort of potential energy is then going to turn into some sort of kinetic energy when the pendulum gets to the bottom. We see this both in the rigid body pendulum and in the point mass pendulum. Let's first take a look at the point mass pendulum. We have some potential energy. It's going to go to kinetic energy. The potential energy in this case, we're going to pretend that for the pendulum in red, the velocity is zero. So the potential energy is simply due to mass times gravity times height. That's going to turn into kinetic energy in the form of one half mv squared. And we see that the velocity equals square root of 2gh. This we've seen before. Now let's take a look at what happens with the rigid body pendulum. Once again, the potential energy is still going to be mass, gravity times height. That's going to equal the energy due to the center of mass, which is one half mv squared. But there's an additional term because we're looking at a rigid body. That's one half i omega squared. And if we weren't run through all the math, we'll see that uh, the velocity equals the square root of 2gh times the square root of m over m plus i over r squared equals velocity. Here we see some sort of correction due to the polar moment of inertia. Let's go back up here. The potential energy in the case of the rigid body goes, pendulum goes to both the movement of the center of mass as well as rotational kinetic energy. However, in the point mass pendulum, all of the energy goes to the velocity of the center of mass, which means the velocity of the center of mass can get much bigger. Hence, bigger acceleration, faster angular velocity. In summary, we compared our point mass pendulum with our rigid body pendulum. We saw that the free body diagrams were pretty much the same. We saw that the big influence came in the change of angular momentum and that the polar moment of inertia 
influence our final result. And in the case of a pendulum, it ends up slowing down the pendulum. I look forward to seeing you in our next video modules when we get a chance to explore some other overly simplified systems that we've solved, but now with a new skill of a more in-depth understanding of angular momentum.